Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Daffy's Roundtable. Today, we are not talking about reptiles, but we are talking about bioactive enclosures. Today, I'm joined by Corbin from Planet Inverts, and we talk about all the coolest inverts from snails to slugs to darkling beetles. We even touch on millipedes, isopods, basically everything you need for a bioactive setup, but not just any regular bioactive setup. We discuss tropical bioactive setups and Towards the end of the episode, we talk about arid bioactive setups, which is something I know that many people have been looking for information on. I have personally been looking for a lot of information on it. But we also dive deep into the snail care, into the slug care, how they breed, uh, all the interesting information. If you are looking to become a snail or slug enthusiast or breeder or keeper, this is the episode for you. Um, I truly, I, I I went into it like kind of curious about these species, and now I'm fascinated by them. Um, I've even got my own slugs going, so let's see how it goes. But before we get into all of that, allow me to thank Exoterra for sponsoring this podcast and making this episode possible. Exoterra makes quality products for our pet reptiles to make them feel at home. Okay, enough of the rambling. This is a super fascinating episode. I hope you all enjoy it. Everybody, please help me welcome Corbin of Planet Inverts. Corbin, hello. Thank you very much for joining. Super excited to do this episode. Um, you know, this is a reptile podcast, so we usually talk reptile stuff. But today we're going to switch it up, and uh, we're going to talk about your fascinating world um, of what do you? What would you call them? Are, would they be considered inverts? Yeah, I would classify like every, pretty much everything I work with inverts, invertebrates. Cool, awesome. Okay, so before we get into everything. I think people keep pets for many different reasons um, and, and and you know, for, for reptiles, some people like to handle them, some people like to watch them, uh, that kind of thing. What is the your fascination in the species you keep? I think a lot of it has to do with, I compare it in a way to when people keep like dart frogs and stuff where it's a smaller animal that you can keep, you keep much more of a heavily planted setup, whereas like the larger the reptile you keep, the less generally in most cases the less bioactive you can keep it but when it comes to like the snails and slugs i keep you can keep like much larger species of snails and slugs and other invertebrates without really having any issues with what plant to keep with them yeah that's awesome and i'm super glad glad you said the word bioactive there because that's definitely a topic i want to uh dive heavily into today but before we get into all of that um tell us a little bit about corbin tell us about planet inverts how did you get started uh, I was around 2017 when I first started getting into invertebrates. Back when my last uh, reptile passed away, I started getting into bioactive tanks like the last year I was keeping him. And after he passed away, I just kept working more and more on the bioactive setup and in, in general. It's like, what else can I add to it? Like, how else can I improve on it? And back then, like 2017 era, like before, like pre pre 2020, there wasn't really much diversity in regards to like a bioactive setup. Like it was still pretty, a pretty new thing. Like a lot, most people were keeping very basic isopods, very basic springtails, some couple of plants. And that's what most people would have considered bioactive at the time, right? Very, very simplistic. Like, and I just kind of expected, what I wanted to do was like, how can we go further with this? like what other invertebrates can we work with what other like what kind of plants can i put in here what how how natural can i make this without having to use anything like plastic or man-made like basically everything in this setup is all there's nothing fake in the setup all the bark all plants everything all this is real in the setup yeah that's awesome so then when people in in the reptile hobby use the term bioactive um do you think that they're that how do I phrase this question without um, I guess I guess my question is are people doing bioactive right or are we just calling it bioactive and missing a bunch of stuff it's bioactive is a very broad term because it's with bioactive it's basically anything I in, in how I would describe it is anything that's effectively self-sustainable and like naturalistic so you're still keeping you're keeping all the live plants or you're keeping like you're keeping cleanup crew in there. Like when the majority of the tank is effectively a naturalistic tank, that's what I would consider a bioactive setup. 
Like if you've got like little invert, like even if you have earthworms, you have springtails, it, it can be as simple as that or as complicated as this. It doesn't need to be some like thousand dollars, thousands of dollar kind of setup. It can be as small as like a little jar that you keep in the corner of your room. Yeah. With a little fern in it. Cool. Okay. So why don't you run us through this uh, giant setup that you have behind you? Um, I, I, or maybe we'll, we'll kind of perfect. You mainly keep uh, it's it's slugs, snails, and beetles, right? Yep. And uh, isopods and other. Basically anything that's with the term the Tritivorus attached to it is what I keep. Cool. Okay. Um, so the, and and then is this tank behind you a does is it a communal tank with multiple different um, Tritivorus in there? Yep. Uh, this is primarily my main setup here, where I've got. A handful of different slug species, snail species. I also keep this kind of some of the slower breeding, flashy species of isopods in here that tolerate the humidity, because a lot of isopod species don't actually like the high humidity snails and slugs do. Um, but this is kind of how I use this is my like tester tank effectively, where if the species can thrive in here, like actively, actively eat, actively like sleep, actively do anything and everything just fine no issues i am comfortable like eventually breeding them selling them and because i know if they can survive in here like just fine they'll survive for anyone else really yeah and and it's kind of hard to see from the camera but but mm -hmm. from from my end it looks like you do not have a drainage layer is do, do you have something under the substrate I, or is it substrate all the way down i do have drainage right here so it's hard to see because it's the drainage layer is actually right here Okay, cool. So just under this lip is uh, all the clay I have under here. It's this very thin layer of drainage. But otherwise, most of the water is just kind of, most of the water generally just sits right in the soil. I don't generally have a light. It's not watered so heavily that there is water sitting underneath of it. Yeah. How, how often are you, are you watering it and, and do, I guess, do, uh, do the animals in there drink water or do they absorb liquid through their food or like how does how does uh, it, you're, you're adding humidity purely for the humidity not for like sort of moisture for the animals right uh yes and no uh because in some species where they'll eat pure a good example would be as a feeder species mealworms uh they get all their moisture through their food like you don't spray you don't spray them with water or nothing. Like you toss in like carrot or potato, that's where they'll get all their moisture from. And similar to a lot of other species like snails and slugs, a lot of their moisture just comes from their surrounding environment or what they eat. Like they'll even like they do drink they do technically drink water. So but a lot of times it's just you I spray the setup with like a fine mist or the humidity eventually builds up so much with the fogger that water starts dropping from the top water starts driving from the top or off of plants because it's so humid or like if their water if their food here gets damp enough they get water through that as well yeah and, and i see you running a fogger on it is that running 24 7 or is it kind of on a timer uh generally i, I run it overnight if only if it's like really hot out just because it keeps the humidity high enough that i can run the fan to pull the humidity out at the same time and it cools the tank down because there's some days we had this summer where it got to like 29, 30 plus degrees before the humidity. Yeah, like, and even with the AC on where, where I had these guys set up, it still gets to like 25. And 25 is kind of like the upper echelon of heat, for the I would say, for them. And so I use the fogger just to keep the humidity high enough while using the fan to cool them down. Fascinating. Okay, and then so... What about diet? First of all, are you feeding them all the all the species in that tank the same thing, and do they all do they all eat at the same time? Because that would be really cool to watch. Um, and then, do you worry about uh, your life plants getting eaten? Will will they eat uh, leaves that haven't fallen on the ground or that kind of thing? Uh, in terms of the actual diet for most species, it, a majority of species I keep are generalistic eaters, where you can feed them. The, the superfood for pretty much any invertebrate you can ask for is carrots. Like buy, buy a bag of carrots from the store for three to five bucks. It'll last you a few months. 
Um, but you can throw in like fish flakes. You can give them uh, fish flakes, oats. Uh, the only thing that most species are picky on is like proteins. So when you get to more predatory and omnivorous species like leopard slugs and the yellow cellar slugs, if you if it's close enough, the camera's close enough, there's this big yellow guy here. Uh, they're more omnivorous, so they will break down. So if you throw in like a good example would be a freeze-dried minnows. Uh, they're generally used as like a cat or dog treat, but I use them as a high protein source for these guys because they have like 60, 70 percent protein and they'll devour the whole thing. Uh, whereas if I feed the freeze-dried minnows to some of my snail species, they won't touch the minnow at all. So it all depends. The, the main key thing for snails and slugs is what protein will they take to. Otherwise, you can toss in a majority of things. They'll be fine. Like carrots, carrots, radishes, squash. Like They'll be fine. Uh, but proteins are the main thing that I find most people struggle with with their snails and slugs. And as for the plants, there's I have one species that eats live plant matter, but it's very few types of plants you'd even be keeping in a terrarium, because most of the diet would be consistent of like very leafy, like temperate plants you find in your backyard, whereas they're not going to eat like the thick, rubbery, sometimes even toxic plants that you'll you'd be putting in your terrarium. And yeah, and most snails don't particularly eat live plant matter. Usually it's a case of it's the only food source available. That's why a lot of slug species, slug and snail species can be considered pests around houses because if they're being naturalized to an area where they don't have any other food source to go to, so their food source is what's in your garden. Right. That makes sense. And then, so in terms of the substrate, are you using any specific substrate? Um, are, are they particular to, you know, a, a a more sandy kind of substrate or, or whatever, like, yeah, break down the substrate you're using specifically in that varium or just what you use for uh, keeping them. Uh, generally, I use a blend, like the most basic blend I would use for snails and slugs is if you're just doing bare bones, no blend, uh, black earth, like just a cheap bag of black earth from your local hard, like hardware store or garden center, or that, that'll do the trick if you just want to keep them in a small little setup on their own. Black earth does, does just fine. Uh, but if you want like a totally bioactive blend, not just for snails and slugs, but like obviously plant friendly and other invertebrates will also break it down. Uh, it's a blend of black earth, uh, flake soil. Uh, what else do I add? I, I do add a little bit of sand just for uh, millipedes. Millipedes like a bit of a sandier blend, very small amount. Uh, I'll also add some leaf litter to it. I'll add some rotting wood if I have it available. Usually I just have a pile of wood in the backyard and they'll I'll just break it I'll just crumble it up and throw it in the substrate um what else do I add if I have peat moss available I'll throw that in and otherwise I also use like sometimes a tropical soil blend just for the plants to give them a little bit of a fertilizer head start or where so they're not just sitting in unfertilized soil where eventually it will break down and be fertilized uh the only thing I would avoid nine times out of ten is cocoa Cocoa, I know cocoa is very, very popular for the reptile hobby. Just because, one, it's so easily accessible. It's not prone to fungus gnats. It's not prone to, like, molding or anything. Uh, it just, and it also holds a lot of humidity. Uh, the only reason I avoid that is because a lot of the Tritivora species that will try to eat the cocoa, cocoa can't be broken down by a majority of the Tritivorous invertebrates. Like the word, literally, for example, the when it comes to millipedes, you absolutely cannot use cocoa because they will try to eat it and they will die if they try to eat it because it compacts in their stomach and they can't digest it. That's fascinating. So it's yeah. So I guess the the reason I asked the question is because I've been hearing so much about the talk of flake soil for isopods and how we're actually keeping isopods on the wrong substrates because they require so much nutrients from the substrate they eat. So I guess the, the the question I had about them is like, are they are they absorbing? Are you, you said you're putting in rotting wood? Are they breaking down, and eating the rotting wood? Are they eating other parts of the substrate? Is there specific things that you need to add that they they that they require as part of their diet, or are they pretty hardy on whatever you put them on? Uh, when it comes to uh, for 
uh, isopods or snails and slugs? Uh, no, sorry, I'm asking about uh, snails and slugs. I just hear I just hear it a lot about isopods, so I'm kind of using. Oh, okay. They're they're my my like I guess in terms of inverts, that's the thing I would say I have the most experience with. So I'm kind of trying to relate that to this to kind of get a general idea of how you keep them, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, well, it comes when it comes to flake soil, I wouldn't say it's it's not necessarily a requirement for the snails and slugs. Uh, I would just find it's better in terms of a bioactive substrate more than cocoa because especially if with some of your cleanup crew like a lot of springtail species will also break down flake soil like more of the burrowing springtail species like lilac springtails and orange springtails will also break it down because there is pro there is some protein in the flake soil itself uh, generally because the because you when you make flake soil it's blended with some flour which that adds some protein to the soil um, but when it comes to the snails and slugs, they don't need the flake soil, but if you're keeping them bioactive, I find it helps in the long term. That's interesting. What about, um, I hear this, I hear this with, uh, aquatic snails, um, that you need to add calcium to the water so they're, they, they have the enough calcium to build their shells and the shells aren't breaking down and turning all white. Do you need to do something similar for the snail, the terrestrial snails? Uh, yeah, uh, there's a, you have to do the same thing, but what a lot of people mis do the mistake of is adding calcium to their food. You can't add calcium to their food. You have to give them a calcium source available. Uh, you do this similarly to basically how you would do it for isopods and millipedes. You would do the same for snails. So if you put in like a piece of cuddle bone, they'll just start ra they'll rasp at and eat the cuddle bone over time, and that's how they'll build their, their shells. Uh, I personally just use homemade blend of making my own calcium pucks, which are just a blend of oyster flour with some oyster grit. And I find they take to it much better than the cuddle bones. Cuddle bones are very tough and very dry. Whereas if you make your home, where like with my homemade blend, it's when it's left in humidity like this, it gets a little tacky, which makes it easier for snails to digest. And I found with some of my species, they grow their shells a lot nicer. When they have that source more accessible, it's not they're not spending so much time rasping at cuddle bone. Why can't you put the calcium in their food? Uh, because with snails and slugs, oh, slugs not so much. Snails, uh, they regulate how much calcium they need. If you, because they'll some species only go through growing. They go through like I compare it to like how humans when you get like growing pains. You have like a little when you're growing up, you get like just this, these seasons where you're just actively growing and then you'll just stop. So some snail species do exactly that, where, where they'll grow, grow for like a small, short amount of time, and then they just won't eat any calcium or grow in that time period. A good example of that is my flame tiger snails. Since they grow indefinitely, they only eat calcium within certain times of the year. So they'll just eat, they'll regulate how much calcium they need. But if if their calcium isn't regulated, like naturally regulated by them, it can cause deformities in their shell. So a good example would be, the most common example I see is peeling. So they'll, they'll literally try to sweat the calcium off and it'll cause like their shell to start peeling and flaking. So you, like, you'll literally see like the outer layer of the shell just start thinly flaking off and sh in like little, little, almost like fish flakes of just peeling off their shell. Because they're trying to sweat that excess calcium off. I have seen I have seen that before. I had no idea what it was. That is that is fascinating. So it's it's I guess it's uh if you're putting it in their food, they're forced to consume it, so they're getting overcalcified over time because they can't regulate yeah. it themselves. Fascinating. Okay, cool. Um, with all of these species, yeah, like like we discussed previously, a lot of most people are using just isopods and springtails in their bioactive setups. Is there a way? assuming that the reptile in the tank isn't large enough to eat them, but is there a way, um, or do you recommend that we start using, uh, you know, a mixture of different things? So like the, the isopods with some snails and slugs and, and, and all of that? Uh, let's see. I have been working with some species that are marketed kind of towards as cleanup crew or like reptiles. Uh, a good example would be quick gloss snails. Uh, the problem with reptiles is uh, when it comes to reptiles, it's very much that reptile is going to eat everything it can find within sight. 
so a lot of people when it comes to isopods still use the very cheap like the very like low end cheap fast breeding species just so they're sustained in their setup whereas when you're going for like a purely invertebrate setup you're going to probably be going for the more flashy more right like the larger more flashy more expensive looking species is where like you you can afford to put them in their own setup without any risk of getting eaten by set, such and such reptile uh, but with the when it comes to snails i have one species of snail that actually two but primarily one species of snail that works as a cleanup crew uh, i've seen them used a lot for seen them used in dart frog setups i've seen them used in crested geckos as well primarily those two uh, they're quick gloss snails they're like this big but they basically act exactly like how springtails would like 90 percent of their diet is fecal matter and the rest of it's all various other detritus. Like the carrots in this setup, once they go like totally rotten, like this mushy carrot, the snail eat the larger species won't touch it, but the quick gloss snails will start breaking it down when it's in that state. So they prefer the really, really rotten stuff. And I have another species for when it comes to like bioactive diversity at a very in, on a reptile level. I have greenhouse millipedes. So they're they're a common, like literally a greenhouse species of millipede. They're about like that big, but same thing. They act a lot like springtails. They'll they're generalists. They'll clean up pretty much anything and everything they can find. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, I have two follow-up questions. Assuming a reptile was to ingest one of these, um, you know, you have it in as a cleanup crew, and it happens to ingest a slug or a slug or a snail, is it harmful to the reptile? That is, to a degree, species dependent. Uh, there are some species that have studies show that they produce that one that some species produce a toxin, uh, where most most species don't. Whereas, like most of the snails and slugs here, don't produce anything. They're more so they produce their looks to make them look like they're da like dangerous to eat, like bright yellow colors, very vibrant, very eye catching. Um, a good example would be the flame tiger snails. They produce a br like a really vibrant red or orange colored foot, basically like how most animals do. Like they produce those colors to look like they're toxic when they're really not. Uh, uh, the only species I know of that I keep that has any study showing that they're mildly toxic is the Budapest slugs. Uh, and the only thing that they're known to be toxic to is uh, snail eating beetles. So like uh, predatory beetles, uh, but otherwise like not no known like toxins or anything. And in terms of, I know one thing that people are always uh, paranoid of is uh, parasites, like parasites in snails and slugs. But when it, all the species I sell are all captive bred, I see no signs of like lungworm or anything within them. And anything that I immediately can't, anything like I've gotten that is wild, like initially wild, is isolated and quarantined before being introduced to anything else. Yeah, and I do want to talk about that. But before we jump back to that, uh, my second follow up question on having these animals as a bioactive setup is uh, when you put them in, are you needing to supplementary feed them? Or is the fecal matter from the reptile enough? Like, what's what's the balance between having them satisfied and well fed so that they're not eating the plants in the setup? Oh, for the when it comes to the quick gloss snails and the greenhouse millipedes, like, in, they're not going to be touching any of the plants in the setup. They're going to be breaking down. Like, you put in leaf litter, you put in, like, and you have like the fecal matter. Even some of the snails, I find they'll go for like the remains of. It's like that that gecko powder blend that turns into like a mush for like crusted geckos and stuff. It's like that. Yeah, like Rabashi or Pangea or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, I find like some people have told me stories of like where the bowl just ends up getting full of them just because they like they like that stuff. Like they just end up cleaning that up after the fact. Um, but yeah, it's same thing as the like, guy spots. It's they're just pretty much total cleanup crew. Uh, but as but in terms of like larger species as like a cleanup crew for reptiles. Uh, when it comes to like, the species I keep in here, which are majority of my large species, uh, you're going to be keeping them pretty much on their own because otherwise you're going to risk them getting predated on by a reptile. 
and that's what I primarily focus on is invertebrate focused tanks. Inks like, for example, like you get like a leopard slug that's like this long, fully grown. It's you're not putting that in a tank with a crested gecko that's gonna see that immediately and eat it. Yeah, for sure, that makes sense. Okay, and then and so let's talk about you know you bringing them in, um, and let's before we get into that, let's talk about uh, permits and legalities. So, are there laws? preventing us from keeping these species? Um, are there specific air, like, are, can we only keep native slugs and snails? Can we keep, like, how does, how does this work? Uh, in terms of the laws, uh, of course, everything's always subject to change from like any point in time. But uh, generally the rules are, as long as it occurs in Canada, uh, it has to, be, to occur in Canada, whether it's an introduced species or native species, uh, the species cannot be an agricultural a blacklisted agricultural pest. So a good example that's used like in the European hobby is giant African land snails. Those are illegal in Canada. Uh, but an example that follows the first rule but is banned on the second rule. So you know, the, you know like the term escargot, so the species that are generally farmed for escargot are also illegal in Canada. But the species is found here, but it's illegal to own because it's an agricultural pest species. Uh, and then the other rule would be the species can't be photo like identified for the first time in Canada. So just because you found it here, unless it's actually been established, you cannot own it here. And of course, the other case being protected species. So a good example is Western banded tiger snails, Carolina mantle slugs. They're protected species here in Ontario specifically. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And and so maybe off that we'll we'll talk about how you kind of acquire them. Um, are you going out to certain locations with specific species in mind that you're hoping to find, or do you kind of just come across them and go, I'll grab a group of these and and you know start uh, culturing them? Or yeah, how does it work? Generally, yeah, it's like if I'm hiking anywhere and uh, a good a good website to like find kind of a general location of species is iNaturalist gives me kind of an idea of where I should go to find some species if I want to start working with some species. And nor am I promoting just going out oh, and wild catching, like just go pick this, pick this, pick this. I only work with, I only start cultures off of anywhere from four to six of a species of the species. Then I don't pick anything else just because obviously you don't want to damage wild populations. You don't want to do any of that. And obviously the, you're not going to like, provincial parks and stuff like that and grabbing this and this and this. Yeah, I know for sure. I, I, I always ask questions like this and then feel like I made a mistake afterwards and should put disclaimers. Disclaimers, don't go ruining wild populations. Um, I'm just, I'm just curious. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, and then there must be like thousands and thousands of, of these species, right? Like there, there isn't just the one native snail species and the one native slug species. Like there must be, many different ones right oh yeah there's there's a lot like when when i first started coming to the reptile expos uh, a lot of people were surprised to even hear that we have like like i show them like native snail species i have on display and they're surprised to even see the species like they've never even heard of them because most species most people know of uh grove snails pardon me grove snails which are like little yellow usually yellow yellow shells with the black the brown or black banding on them most people that's what most people know because they're so close to humans uh but a lot of snails and slug species are really well hidden i find in our woodlands a good example is with i'll bring up again flame tiger snails they're not as active as some other snail species but they hide under they hide under bark they hide under leaf litter they kind of burrow very lightly but a lot of times you wouldn't really see them unless you're out there be during or after a rainfall or during a cool, cool temperature period. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very interesting. So you said, so you said, uh, they're, they're not, yeah, they're not as hidden. So, or they are. Yeah. They're, they're harder to find. I would say, uh, just yeah. cause either people just don't know where to go because the, obviously the information's not accessible or they're going when the conditions aren't correct to actually go find said species. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And then so once you've acquired the species, you said you take four to six, um, you're setting them up. Uh, yeah. Can you sort of break down how you set them up? And then what's the breathing? Pro Maybe we'll take them species by species or not species because we can't go, go individual species of every single snail, every single <laughs> slug. But um, like, are you setting all the snails up the same, all the slugs up the same, all the beetles up the same? And then how? Yeah. Uh, in terms of how I would set up an individual setup here, so this is a good example of a species that I'm more recently working with. These are coped snails. Uh, I've been trying to get them to breed for a while. Uh, for uh, reasons unknown, they're they're just not doing ups and downs. Like they're being active, but after they're maturing, they're passing away. So I'm just trying to figure out what's the causality of that. But that's why I haven't introduced them to any other species, just because the risk of I don't know if they're they've been something's been introduced to their population that is causing it, or if it's just the species itself, they have a very short lifespan as adults, I'm not sure. But that's a similar case if I would set them up in something pretty much identical to this jar and work with them in an isolated setup with, with no contact with any other species. Yeah, and I'm just gonna, I guess, um, kind of explain that jar for the people that aren't watching, listening. It's like a, almost like a two gallon glass jar um, and it looks completely sealed. Am I right to say that? Is there no uh, ventilation no. on that, or the it is? It's not completely sealed. It's a loose lid, so there is like, so you can just open it like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They they can't escape from that. Like, if you put like the tiniest little slug species, it will escape through a lip like that big. But like snails and larger snails and slugs, they're not getting out of this. Cool. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming you're keeping it super high humidity. And then, how yeah. often are you feeding them? And uh, yeah. Generally, I feed them protein. Most snail and slug species, I would feed protein once to twice a week. Uh, for most slugs, you want to feed protein twice a week. For snails, I would say at least once a week, because snails will generally be less active than slugs. Um, and what else was there? Uh, and yeah, as for but as for keeping them constantly fed, just literally just toss in like a chunk, break in a carrot in half, it'll last you like two, three weeks. Oh, you just kind of leave it in. Okay, cool. And and so how do snails breed? Are they laying eggs? Are they, how, how, how does that work? Uh, so yeah, they, with most snail species, it's uh, one of the two partners will lay eggs. So what they do is they have what's called a love dart, which is, which one snail will inject into the other. Basically, essentially forcing that one to be the one to lay the eggs. Because unlike slugs, snails don't like to carry eggs. Because it's on top of having the shell, they now also have the burden of carrying these eggs. Um, uh, before you continue, also, sorry, are there, are there, in, are there individual um, sexes for snails? Or, because the way you, you said that, it kind of made it sound like either or could be the one carrying the, the eggs. Oh, and do they mate for life or yeah <laughs> i'm fascinated <laughs> by this by this now okay yeah because <laughs> uh, all snails and slugs with the exception of maybe some groups that evolved at different times i've heard that there's some species that don't do this but 99 percent of all snail and slug species are all going to be hermaphrodites so they have both male and female breeding organs that's fascinating. And then once they're mating, are they mating with you? You said partner as well. Is it just the? Do, are they pairing like two snails for life, or is it every season kind of they're finding a different snail buddy? Uh, yeah, it's not. They're not like specific with any particular other partner or anything. It's just generally if one snail wants to mate, another snail that does want to mate will go and mate with that snail. Uh, it's more so the difference of. They want to mate, but who wants to? Who's going to be carrying the eggs? Uh, because yeah, snails don't like to carry eggs. <laughs> Fascinating. Okay, and so now they are carrying the eggs. How long are they carrying the eggs for? And then where are they depositing them? Uh, it can be anywhere from in smaller species. It can be anywhere from a week to upwards of a month where they're carrying them, and they'll lay them generally under lightly under some debris, so like under some like sphagnum moss, under some leaf litter, under some bark. Like that's, and then they'll just lay them maybe an inch or two into the soil. And how long do they take to hatch? <laughs> uh, to hatch, uh, most species average about two weeks to hatch. Some species upwards of a month to hatch. And I'm assuming they're very, very big clutches of, of babies. 
Uh, no, actually. Uh, most snail species that are legal here in Canada produce very small clutches of eggs. Mm. Uh, for flame tiger snails, uh, they only produce about an average of like 15 eggs and they only breed whereas like flame tiger snails they grow indefinitely so they they can afford to do this they only lay about 15 eggs every four every four or five months or so it can be anywhere from like as low as like five eggs to 25 uh and when it comes to grove snails grove snails are same they have the same range of anywhere from like five to 25 but they'll do it within a set breeding season so within that, within the, like a two month period, they'll lay about three clutches of eggs, ranging anywhere from like five eggs to twenty five eggs. I am now fascinated by snails. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, and 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 is this happening seasonally? So is this just happening? Oh, and then and then on the seasonal note, what happens? Okay, you know what. Uh, okay, there's so much to unpack here. Okay, so uh, how how often are snails laying eggs? Is it multiple times a year? And then uh, I'll ask the, the the next question afterwards, so I don't confuse you. <laughs> uh, generally, a lot of it has to do with it, a majority of it is seasonal. Uh, when it comes to most snail species, this is, this currently is their breeding season. So anywhere from August to end of September is generally the season where most snail and slug species are going to be breeding and then laying eggs. Uh, Cause I, some like generally the last clutches I get that are hatched are like mid October. And I don't really see much after that. The only species I have that breeds year round is the flame tiger snails, but that's because they breed your, during the cooler seasons. So I find that they breed more in the spring and fall. And in the winter too, because they're inside. Uh, but they don't breed at all. For they're almost totally inactive for me during the summer. That's super interesting. And what's happening to all these animals when outside is like minus three thousand over here in Canada? Obviously, oh, it makes <laughs> to say indoor heating, so they're totally fine. They're like they'll just they won't go into a dormant state. They'll just stay active throughout the year, but they won't be in their breeding season or anything. No, but, but in the wild, how, how are they, where are they hiding? Where are they going dormant? Oh, uh, most species tend to just burrow, just burrow underground or burrow under in woodlands. Like they'll burrow under like logs, they'll burrow under rotting wood, all that stuff of just to, and they'll go into a dormancy period. Uh, most snails will just go dormant for the winter and underground and for slugs. Uh, same thing, but some species won't overwinter as adults, so they'll die off as adults, but they'll overwinter their eggs. So the eggs will overwinter, and then the eggs will hatch in spring. What species are those? Uh, the most common species to do this is the chocolate slugs. So they're these larger, they're more common in BC. Uh, these, these larger, uh, anywhere from like black to these bright orange slug species, uh, they only have a lifespan of about a year. Uh, so as far as I'm aware, uh, supposedly possibly longer in captivity because they don't have that overwintering period. But generally, they get to their adult period within within the season, and then they lay their eggs to overwinter before the winter hits. And then the adults just won't make it through the winter. That's awesome. Okay, so that that's kind of like uh, like killifish, like annual killifish, or like triops, or like well, that's very cool. Do you keep those chocolate slugs? Uh, yes, uh, they're and are they breeding here right now. They're nocturnal. I had some breeding with them, but I'm waiting to see eggs because they have one of the longest gestation periods for a slug I'd seen, like upwards of a month or more. Like a month is about like the most I've seen for from breeding to laying eggs. It's like I've only ever seen maybe a period of like two, three weeks, but their average from what I've researched, their average period is about two to four or more weeks before even laying the eggs. And possibly they may even hold on to them before the winter hits just so they're freshly laid. So I'm just waiting to see if I see any clutches of the eggs. Awesome, okay, so now that we've jumped to slugs, I have a little container here that I've already showed you pre-episode pre um, uh, just because we were discussing this, but I have, I have some, what did you call them? Uh, they go by various names, but the name that I use is uh, Milky Field Slugs. Cool. Okay. So for, for those of you watching, these are them. 
for those of you that aren't watching, I have uh, just a deli cup here with a bunch of milky field slugs, question mark. Yep. Um, and okay, so I guess the question is, it's my first time keeping slugs. I just got these. Can you walk us through how you would set something like this up for success? Uh, if you just want to keep them, if you want, uh, if you're just going budget, I would say just get like a tall, like either a small or tall, maybe like a 16 ounce to 32 ounce deli cup for about maybe four to six slugs. Slugs and just put some paper towel on the bottom and give them a carrot and give them the occasional fish flakes. If you're just if you're working with just very budget, very low, very minimal, I would say that would be totally fine. Uh, but as for if you're going for an actual setup, pretty much look into how to make any bioactive setup. Uh, your best bet for any snail slug species for a plant would be uh, common fern species, like very small species. Like you can go for like maiden hairs, you can go for like rabbit's foot ferns, you can go for basically any of the ferns you can find that stores that are like two, three dollars in like a little cup that's about this big. They'll do just fine for them in a planted tank. You don't even have to add any other plants. The ferns will be just fine for them. And then just keep replacing their, just keep replacing the carrots if it gets too rotten, or make sure their food doesn't go moldy. And then, just like it, you're keeping like any other bioactive setups, just keep looking on how you can improve it. Like, can I add springtails to this? Can I add isopods to this? Can I add such and such? And just keep, just keep doing more and more research. Honestly, the the more you learn, the better the better off you are. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so let me ask you this. You, you said paper towel uh, uh, earlier on. Is there a benefit to paper towels versus substrate? And if you are using paper towels, how often are you changing it out? Because I assume they they get quite messy. <laughs> uh, it does get messy after a while. I would say for like a large, if you're like compared, let's say we're using the same deli cup, for example, same size, like 32 ounce. Uh, Let's say I'm keeping one large slug species in there and four of the milky field slugs in there. Like the rate it would take to decompose that paper towel, it would, for the four slugs, it would take for the one slug to decompose. Because uh, the thing is with paper towels too, is they can also eat the paper towel uh, just because with snails and slugs, they don't 100% digest their food. Pardon me. They don't 100% digest their food. So when they, when they poop, it actually breaks down into the paper towel, and they will actually eat the paper towel with where they where they poop. It still has a good example would be carrots. Uh, it'll actually stain the paper towel orange because remains of the carrot are still in their fecal matter, and they will eat it again. So, like, if you're just going totally budget, like, is that bad? Do you do you want to avoid them eating it again? Oh no, they'd be totally fine. They eat like part of their natural diet is fecal matter of larger animals for most species and the fact that also still has like some of the remains of the food in it they'd be they're totally fine with it cool and then and then for somebody that wants to set them up for breeding um i assume the secondary setup with this like would you be able to breed them with paper towels or are you better off doing it with substrate you wouldn't be able to do it with paper towels because they need a place to lay their eggs so you mm -hmm. would need the, you would need a substrate. You need a place for them to be to hide and be comfortable. Basically, the most when it comes to snails and slugs, if you want to optimize their setup, you have to go bioactive for it. Because I've seen people to set them up in bins with like next to nothing available, just like a bin of dirt, basically. And for some species, it works, but it's gonna it becomes a mess, like so much faster than if it was a bioactive setup. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Cool. And then so okay, so we kind of walked through the snail breeding process. Could you walk us through the the slug one? You you, you said they enjoy holding eggs as opposed to, to snails. Why is that? Uh, I wouldn't say so much they enjoy. It's the fact that they uh, since they don't have the burden of owning a shell, uh, they don't have to eat cal. They don't have to actively ingest calcium for their diet. Unlike snails, they can afford to actually both hold eggs when they breed. So there's no fighting over who, because some snail species will actually fight over who is going to lay the eggs. Whereas the slugs, there's like they do do whatever like species specific ritual they have. 
and both species end up walking away carrying with fertilized eggs. Uh, yeah. And there's no, and no reason is too is because they can produce their eggs are unlike snails where snails produce an actual like like a reptile egg they produce a calcified egg. Uh, slugs are more like amphibian eggs where they're actually jelly like, so they can afford to produce more eggs with less resources needed to produce the eggs. Yeah, and and then so I guess similar questions to the snails: How often are they doing it? Um, how big are the you said you said they're bigger, but like how big are we talking here? Like uh, you're getting uh, for, 50, 50 slugs per 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 clutch, or, or yeah, and the the difference between the snails and slugs is many snail species can live for like a multitude of years. Some species with records of ten to fifteen years in captivity. Some larger species even upwards of twenty years. Uh, but slug species they have a shorter with the cost of like, they don't have the weight of the shell, but they can be more active. They have a much shorter lifespan in majority of species. So they produce, so they, at the cost of a shorter lifespan, they produce much more offspring, but still takes on average, most species about two years to mature. And they'll produce upwards of, let's see, some can produce as small as 30 eggs. Some can produce upwards of like 50 to 80 eggs. It takes two years for them to mature, and then is it kind of also seasonal? So like once a year, or is it? Uh, yeah, once 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 they mature, that's kind of it essentially, and they'll only breed. Majority of species only breed about two to three times, and then that's it because it costs them so much to do that. Because whereas the snail with the snails, it's one snail using one organ. So when, because one's carrying the eggs, one's uh, fertilizing the eggs, they only have to use one organ. Where the slugs, they're doing both at the same time. So it costs more pro costs more protein, costs more calories. They, they have to spend more energy just to do that. So if they breed two to three times in a singular season, they've expended so much energy just to produce these eggs. So after those two, three, two to three clutches, they don't breed after that back. So, so I, I, I might have missed something. So, are you, are you saying that slugs are asexual? Uh, they, they can produce asexually in rare, in some rare cases. And snails can too. Um, but the difference is that the, in some, whereas like something like a morning gecko, they produce, uh, they, they are effectively cloning themselves, but they're naturalized to do that. They can produce successful clutches over and over and over uh, a, a self-fertilized clutch uh, from snails and slugs. It has a success rate of like 10 to 20%. Mm -hmm. So even though they would lay, let's say they lay like 50, 60 eggs, maybe only five to 10% of those eggs would even hatch in the first place. Okay. So then when you said this, the slug is using both um, organs, why is that? Uh, because, well, because they're they're working to both fertilize each other's eggs, they're both receiving and fertilizing. Oh, so two slugs will time. will will kind of okay. They'll both hold eggs. Yeah. Whereas the snails, when the snails mate, they only only one will carry the eggs and only one will fertilize. So they're right. only using one of the sexual organs at at a time. Right. Okay. Okay. I I get it now. That's fascinating. Okay. Wow, and you're saying some snail, some slug species take up to two years to reach sexual maturity. Yep. A good wow. example of that is like the, mo the most popular species I keep, the leopard slugs. They, even though like some slug species just grow really fast, they, these guys grow really slowly in comparison to other uh, European species. So they take upwards of two years just to mature and they'll live up to, they'll live up to three years even after their breeding season. Cool. Are you keeping, uh, are you, are, I heard you earlier say maybe Budapest snail or something. Are you keeping European species? And if so, I assume those are species that have been introduced into Canada. Yep. Uh, I do keep majority of like the common species you would find that most pe people know in Canada are actually European species. So like the groves, like the brown -like grove snails that you find around any suburban area, any city, uh, leopard slugs, the yellow cellar slugs, uh, even like the milky field slugs, those aren't those aren't native here either. They're they're all introduced, but they're not 
they're not considered pe like agricultural pests. Is there a best, in your opinion, a best pet slug? Like, is there one that's maybe uh, more active, more out during the day? Uh, you said the chocolates. I think you said earlier that they're, they're nocturnal. Are there diurnal slugs? Like, yeah. Is there a best pet slug? I, I would say for the best pet species, the best, absolute best species would be the leopard slugs, just because they're so active. They're so, they're, they are designed to be like effectively like the ultimate slug. They predate on smaller. They predate on smaller slug species naturally, but their diet is so extremely broad. It can be anywhere from like mushrooms and rotting wood to carrots, apples, uh, any any rotting meats. Like they'll they'll eat it and break it down. And they but they're also extremely active and very large species of slug. Well, like actually, I have a ruler here. My largest. Largest slug I owned got up to 18 centimeters long for leopard slugs. Wow. Wow, that's that's awesome. I'm actually going to quickly, I have seen them before. I've seen you hold them at the expos, um, like kind of have one on your hands. So I kind of have a general, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm those still are some waiting for my largest. I'm still waiting for the record breaking one to come one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fingers crossed. That's cool. Okay, so cool. So we've discussed snails. We've discussed slugs. I don't want to leave out another very cool invert that you are keeping. Tell us about the darkling beetles. Uh, darkling beetles, um, despite a lot of uh, people are like, people always compare them to superworms and mealworms because they are the same group. And a lot of people don't realize superworms and mealworms are darkling beetles. But there's also like groups of beetles that aren't even used as feeders some people will use them as feeders if they get breeding if they breed them um, enough they can be used but you have to watch their breeding rates uh let's see what's a good example here i got my bins beside me here i say this guy here is a desert species here this is one of the largest native species of darkling beetles found in canada and majority of the species you'll find in the hobby or eventually will find in the hobby are all desert species. So they'll be used for like arid bioactives and de like desertish bioactive setups. Very dry, high ventilation. And unlike a lot of beetle species, these guys have a very long lifespan for a beetle. Uh, rep on average, they'll live for about two to three years at as adults. So in this phase, they'll live upwards of two to three years. Some people have owned them for up to four years just as a singular adults. Elsewhere, and they're when it comes to their lifespan as a larvae, so from larvae to adult, only about, it can be anywhere from six to eight months. And Whereas so, okay. Like, no, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say another comparison to like other beetle species, it's, whereas a lot of beetles are, they take upwards of like three to five years just to mature. These guys are only a few months just to mature. Yeah, wow. And and so we'll definitely jump into arid bioactive in, in a minute because that's another fascinating topic. But um, you said, sorry, can, can they be used as cleanup crews, first of all? Oh, 100% oh, they can be used as cleanup crews. They're like, I would say darkling beetles are like a detritivorous superpower. They're a group of beetles that are established globally. And majority of species of darkling beetles are like all detritivorous. They break down all forms. Basically, you name it as a rotting form of matter, they'll break it down. Cool. Okay. So I've heard with, with like things like the superworm beetle, which I think you just mentioned is a type of darkling beetle, hmm. um, that when, uh, when they do more of like the reptiles will eat the superworm larva, but once they are the darkling beetle, uh, most reptiles will avoid them because they have some taste or they, they, uh, put out something. Could you explain that? Yeah, most beetles, most darkling beetles produce a kind of chemical on their skin. Uh, literally, the best example I would compare it to is, you see, this will be to a more specific crowd. So, like the Nintendo Switch, uh, their cartridges are covered or coated in a chemical. So, like if kids try to eat them, they'll spit them out because they taste really bad. That's mm -hmm. ba that's basically the same idea as darkling beetles. The the adults produce a chemical that just makes them taste bad. 
And so because of this, I, I have seen the, the Super Run Beetles kind of be used as like a cleanup crew in um, more arid setups. Because of this, it's possible because the reptiles aren't actually eating them, correct? Yes, and but the reason I would avoid using mealworms and superworms is because they are, I would say they're too efficient. So it, the reason why you wouldn't want to use superworms in an arid bioactive is because they will eat the plants. Because the native range of superworms is actually South America. Uh, so they're actually more of a tropical uh, darkling beetle species. So if you put them in a very high ventilation, very dry setup, they will they will start eating any of the plants they can get their hands on for the or moisture. Yeah. Okay. Whereas these beetles here, their natu their natural their natural environment is just deserts. Majority of their diet is for the adults especially is like dead dry insects. So great for eating like leftover crickets and stuff like that. Yep, leftover crickets, grasshoppers, even like just a dead mealworm or something, they'll eat that. So for for so the people using superworm beetles as as cleanup crews, it's not the most efficient and there are better ways of doing it. Yeah, there's I, how I would classify when it comes to like a lot of the, the tritivorous invertebrates, you have a lot of the showy species, which are like, you get like larger snails and slugs, you get like the the giant American millipedes that you're going to be using more of like, you want this as a big pet species, not as like a cleanup crew. Mm -hmm. And you get like some of the smaller species that are actual cleanup crew, like springtails, greenhouse millipedes, some smaller isopods. And then you get into more like feeder species, which are, they're not very good for bioactives. They're more destructive to bioactives, if anything. For example, like dairy cows, mealworms, superworms. Like, just, I would not trust them with in a five mile radius of any bioactive setup. You, sorry, I'm going to jump off the beetles real quick and, and just touch on that. You said you don't trust dairy cows, like dairy cow isopods. Oh, God. why is that? Uh, because they are extremely aggressive. They are, they are the most, they are the most protein hungry species for how fast they breed. So there might be species that are more aggressive or more protein hungry, but they don't breed as insanely fast and grow up as insanely fast as the dairy cows. It's like dairy cows are even used to the same degree as like domestic beetles where they can, they're used to like clean like animal skulls and everything. That's what I so, use mine for. Yeah, so like <laughs> I would, like I, when I first got into the hobby, like very, very early days, I had dairy cows with greenhouse millipedes and the dairy cows ended up eating every single greenhouse millipede I had. Because when they went to molt, they, the dairy cows would burrow underground and eat the, the millipede while it was molting. That's fascinating. fascinating. So, I, okay, yeah. so dairy cows are the, the worst bioactive ice pod species you can use. When it comes to at least with keeping them with any other invertebrates, but I, even with some reptiles, I wouldn't particularly trust them because I've heard, I have heard some cases where like where the dairy cow population gets so absurd, well, they'll, they'll start irritating the reptiles, especially if they're going to shed or anything. Mm -hmm. They'll like, because this also happens with superworms as well. Well, they'll bite at the reptile, they'll irritate the reptile. You're more prone to stressing out your reptiles for using those species than if you were to use anything else. Is there a best isopod for bioactive setups? It, I would say it's very much conditional. So if you were going for, let's say if you're going for like a tropical setup for crested geckos, you would want to go for a Cubaris marina, which is like a very tropical, very high humidity isopod. Or if you're going very budget, very minimal, even just a basic culture of powders would be way better than throwing in dairy cows. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Okay, cool. So okay, so back to the beetles. Um, how are you keeping it like several different species? And if they're arid, how are how are you how are they native to Canada? Uh, because we have the, the drier climates in Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, eastern uh, eastern BC, and western Manitoba. We have all the drier climates all along there. It's so, like some desert climates. It's you can find them in some seasons. You can find dark like a whole swarm of darkling beetles feeding off of dead like grasshoppers. Wow. Okay. And and how are you keeping them? Are 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 you, like are you setting them up similar to how people would set up like? Well, I guess people. I I don't, I don't even know if that makes sense because people set up superworm larvae in like just oats and kind of let them do their thing. So how are you setting up the, the beetles themselves? 
Uh, the beetles I set up for just for an individual breeding enclosure, not necessarily a bioactive setup. Uh, this is a bin here. So the bin is primarily a blend of flake soil and sand. Uh, and I just have this uh, tree bark here, and you see them all under here. And the larvae basically just all break down. They're, the diet of the larvae is pretty much just the flake soil. And they'll also break down any food scraps from the adult beetles. But they need high ventilation. That's why, good example here, is that I've, got, I've drilled holes all along the side here just to create lots of ventilation for them. Even though it's a closed bin, it creates enough ventilation for them. Do they, uh, can they climb the plastic? Uh, no, they cannot climb the plastic. They're more clumsy, if anything. Okay, cool. Um, okay, and then, sorry, so is there a best, uh, or maybe can you break down how you would do a arid bioactive, and then is there a best cleanup crew uh, darkling beetle species? Uh, let's see here. Uh, for your substrate for an air bioactive setup, you would want a blend of similar to that. You'd want black earth and flake soil, but you'd be you'd be letting one side of the setup dry out and the other side of it be more damp. Because if you're keeping any darkling beetles, the larvae still need moisture, but they can't be drowned in the substrate effectively. Uh, it'd be similar to some drier isopods where they like the range of damp to dry, but you'd be doing that in the substrate. Uh, but you'd also add uh, sand, you can add clay. Uh, you can also add some calcium powder to the soil. Like just like, like I use the oyster flour, you can add a little bit to that, but it's not, ne it's not necessary for it. Uh, you can also add like a little bit of a, like a cactus, uh, like a cactus blend for bioactive setup, uh, cactus potting soil blend. And what I use for it specifically for bioactive is excavator clay. So I have all my substrate laid down. And then for the topsoil is just the excavator clay because it traps the humidity for the substrate underneath while keeping the uh, area all above still bone dry for all the, iso all the arid isopods, the darkling beetles. They doesn't trap the humidity so much that they like suffocate from it because a lot of desert species of darkling beetles can't have high humidity. They like it extremely minimal um but it keeps the humidity below in the substrate just enough for the larvae to still be active because they the larvae can't dry out when you say you use the excavator clay are you wetting it and using it as a clay or are you just using it as loose substrate over you because you said you're, you're kind of using it to cap the more moist humidity subject so are you are you actually wetting it and making it a clay or you're just capping it uh, as loose. Uh, I generally sometimes what I'll do is uh, I'll put some loose clay on top after the fact, and then I'll also add some sand to it. But mainly, it's I wet it all together and just pour it on top of the substrate around all the plants, around all the hardscape, and basically just wait for it to dry out and solidify and then eventually you can put all your live animals in there. And the find the best way to help kind of create the texture you'd want, like add some, add some like tiny like pebbles and granules of rocks and some sand to top it off. That'll also help dry it out a little bit more and create that naturalistic environment for an arid bioactive you need instead of just the dried out clay. Cool, yeah, so, so this um, the setup behind me is um, stone desert, not excavated clay, but yeah. Um, and, and, and it, the, the substrate, the bottom layer is just sand. There's no black earth. There's no, and it's completely like bone dry. The only, I spray, I spray the tank down, um, for humidity. And then there is a water bowl, but otherwise the substrate stays super dry. Um, could I add a cleanup crew to it? Or is that too dry for them? Will they start eating the plants? Not that there's many plants in there, but would they start eating the plants or would they just not survive? Uh, yeah. Would you be able to add a cleanup crew to a purely sand setup, I guess, is my question? Uh, there are some species you would be able to add. Because the thing with sand is there's there's a difference between, because people don't differentiate arid between desert. So arid is like you want it dry, but not like bone dry like a desert. If it's very loose sand, I wouldn't. It'd be a little eh 
like if it's if it's so loosey like you can stick your finger right down into it and your finger sinks right in but there but if you put like your finger into it and like there's some pushback from the substrate like a little bit loose like maybe like you put like your fingernail into it it should be fine for adult beetles but for larvae they need they need a, a damp a damp to dry range of substrate in order to thrive the adults themselves will be totally fine though yeah that's interesting is there um and i don't know I, i've seen like uh the blue feigning death death beetles and those kind of things would those things work in a purely sand setup and are those things would they be considered good cleanup crews they would be if they were legal here in canada but oh, we can't keep them no we can't keep them here in canada because it generally a lot of the invertebrate laws are very similar to the laws for sales and slugs where if it doesn't occur here for this is for at least the tredivorous species like beetles uh if it doesn't occur here it's not legal here essentially unless it unless explicitly stated by uh, some import permit of a live species yeah that's super interesting sorry did you did you already mention what you would recommend what kind of um darkling beetle you would recommend oh. for the arid um uh, kind of bioactive uh if you want something that's faster breeding that's a bit faster breeding it's a little shorter lived it's only it's still a long lifespan of like two years as an adult uh these guys here these are very fast Ooh. these guys are pie dish darkling beetles you can kind of see by their body shape very concave but these guys love it uh, love it more i would say they love it drier than some of my other darkling beetles uh they like you can leave them like totally no lid like 100 percent ventilation and they'll be totally fine with that and similar like they'll clean up like dead insects they'll clean up like some other food scraps and they'd be fine and is there anything other than darkling beetles you could use for an arid setup? I, I assume isopods are an absolute no way. Oh no, you can't. You can't keep isopods. Uh, good. The most common group for an arid species uh, would be the Spanish giant group of isopods. Isopods. So you'd have like the Porcelli magnificus. You'd have uh, Porcelio hoffmanseggi, uh, Porcelio expansus. Like those larger ice pods that get like this big, like get about this big, they all love the drier environments. That's fascinating. I assume you'd still sort of need to create some form of humid area for them though. Yeah, so if how I have it set up in my tank is because the I have a section of the substrate that's damper. I have a piece of cork tunnel that goes into the substrate, like breaking breaking up the excavator clay, but it goes into the substrate on an angle. So the ice pods all hide in that section because it creates a little humid area for them during the day. Then they come out at night. Uh, in any other setup, you could just provide a little, like a big piece of bark with some uh, sphagnum moss underneath of it, then lightly mist it on occasion. And they'd be totally fine with that. Fascinating, fascinating. Cool. Let's maybe quickly touch on feeders. You you mentioned as you were saying saying. Uh, the different darkening beetles that there are some specific ones that you would recommend more as feeders than others i assume mealworms and superworms are part of that group are there any others that would make good feeders that we're just not having the hobby that we should uh I'm trying to think it's mainly those two there's some people that they've cultured some species enough that they can use them as feeders but it's also a case of maybe they're not selling them enough that they can just use them as feeders on their own because like no other species that I'm aware of is getting to the same breeding rate as like superworms and mealworms. There's like there's also like buffalo worms, but they're like tiny little guys that are used alongside their mested beetles to break down like animal skulls and all that. But they're so small, you're not really using them as a feeder for like most species. You're just gonna be using mealworms anyways. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I assume we have. Oops. I assume it's the same problem with these snails and the slugs that um, they just don't breed at a fast enough rate, and that's why we're not seeing them being used as feeders. Yeah, that's that's primarily the case. Is that it's they don't breed remotely fast enough. Like the the best example I give is because the biggest problem with snail information online is it's all around giant African land snails because the European hobby of giant African land snails is so big and other people around the globe 
want a giant snail that covers your hand. So the best example I give is in the time it takes for me to produce one generation of flame tiger snails, you can get four to six completely unique generations of giant active land snails. Because flame tiger snails take two and a half to three years to mature, giant active land snails only take six months. Wow, yeah, and, and I've also heard that the giant African land snails, when they lay eggs, they're laying like not 30, 40, 50, they're laying like two, three, four hundred eggs at a time. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess they would be a great feeder snail, but we just don't have them available in the hobby or here. Yeah, it, it, it's mainly they, they're they also the main risk species when it comes to the parasites you hear about when it comes to snails. Oh, okay, cool. Because yeah. they come from a tropical country, those parasites are more common and like, most giant African, obviously African, um, they come from different species of giant African land snails because it's a general nomenclature, like Spanish giant isopods. It's the same idea as giant African land snails. There's multiple species, actually. It's not just one individual, uh, but they all come from various regions across Africa. So, but that a lot of the parasites that are known are from giant African land snails. That's super interesting. And, and, and I don't know if you, you would know the answer to this or if this question even makes sense, but what about breeding aquatic snails for feeders for terrestrial species? Is there is that a no-no? Is there a reason why? Um, I've heard that they could have diseases as well that could affect the reptiles. Do you know anything about that? In terms of aquatics, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, uh, yeah. yeah. It, the aquatics are always just a whole new like gap of information for me. Like, yeah. I, when it comes to like anything terrestrial, I know a good majority of it when it comes to the Canadian hobby, at least. But when it comes to like aquatic snails, that's just way over my head. <laughs> no, that's that's fair. Um, I, I so the, the main reason I ask about all these different feeders is because I think I think that I don't think I'm sure that wherever these reptiles that we're that we, we keep are from, they're not eating uh, crickets and mealworms and superworms. And even if they are, it's not exclusively. And there was um, somewhere, uh, I don't remember if I read this or it was I was told by one of the other mountain horn dragon keepers, but apparently the majority of what the, the younger ones are eating in the wild are spiders and slugs. Um, and so I do think it would be interesting to kind of have some form of variety. Uh, but I also understand that it, it, it could be hard to make it worth while for somebody to be breeding them especially if they breed so slowly and you probably have to price them at ridiculous prices and, and yeah uh, yeah and, and it's a similar case like even even like the smallest species of slug takes a minimum of a year to mature like the good example the milky field slugs you have there they take at least a year to mature even in captivity wow yeah do you see a future where it could be a possibility of um us having and, and not just necessarily snails and slugs just with your knowledge of native Canadian inverts, are there something else out there that we could be using as feeders that we're not? And do you see that being a possibility in the future? Unfortunately, I don't see it. Because there are, I've looked into some potential species, but the only species that breed at the rates that you would want are like that big. Like the garlic snails, they only get about that big. And even then they produce a smell of garlic that mm. reptiles wouldn't even want to go anywhere near. Right. That's what makes them un distasteful. But otherwise, there's not really much else you would be able to produce at the rate of like a feeder species. That makes sense. That's that's uh, it's quite it's 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 a little sad, but it makes sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I don't uh, worry. I get the question all the time about feeder snails and slugs. <laughs> I know you do. I I I'm probably I I've asked you personally. I've asked you this at like probably like six or seven expos already. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm sure you get it quite a bit, especially at the Reptile Expos. Um, is there, yeah, is there a, not an, or in my opinion, not enough people are keeping and enjoying um, these fascinating species that you keep and work with. Is there something you would like to, you know, the parting words to leave people with that would kind of, you know, open their eyes and say, you should check these out. This is why you should be keeping them. Is there, you know, like for example, um, ants, not that I know much about ants, but 
one of the big things that attracts ant keepers to ants is all the little fascinating behaviors they have, the the way the colony reacts together, blah, blah, blah. Is there something like that that kind of like the the hook, I guess, for uh, snails and slugs and, and darkling beetles as well? Uh, and primarily with snails and slugs, I would say, is versus like people who want to make like a bioactive reptile setup. There's a whole, like, I know you got to, like, keep, like, UVB lights. You got to keep them, like, heated all the time. If you just wanted to make, like, a little planted tank that sits in your windowsill, like, most months out of the year, you can just make a simple planted tank like this that'll last, that'll last you a long time. And you can just put some, you can put, like, a large slug species in it. You can put, like, a couple snails, even, like, some a millipede. You can put anything in this in this little jar that you would want. For when it comes to invertebrates no special lighting no special heating they're fine totally on their own just like this do you keep millipedes i do keep millipedes i keep the american giants and greenhouse millipedes and working on a few other species but those are pending that's very cool what about um uh cohabbing these species with like a a, a jumping spider or uh you know, one of those smaller species of spiders is, is I guess, with the humidity be the issue or is it something that's doable? I know with them, when it comes to jumping spiders, they don't like the high humidity. Okay, so yeah. the the conditions would be too conflicting. Uh, so, for example, like you wouldn't really be able to keep a jumping spider in with darkling beetles because it'd be too dry. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't be able to keep them with the snails and slugs because it'd be too humid. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Um, we have some cool expos coming up. You are going to be at some of these cool expos. Uh, what can people expect to find on your table? Are you, uh, you know, I, I, I've noticed you kind of like do these drops of like new species. First time you're having it at the expo. Is there any new new species drops that you're going to be having, uh, you know, for the rest of the 2024 year, early 2025? Is there something you're super excited about that you want to tell us about before we, we wrap this up? Uh, yeah, uh, when in, for the upcoming fall expos, if if there are any, I'm assuming there will be. I, I expect uh, there will be. Yeah, I'm assu just assuming. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to be focusing on arid bioactives for the rest of 2024. I will have more. I will have my sales and slugs available at every show. Awesome. Uh, but I will be focusing on arid bioactive species for the coming expos. So like these guys will be starting for sale for the first time at the coming reptile expos, the Pydesh darkening beetles. Those are the ones you said would do good as arid bioactives. Yep, they're, they they will like the adults like it bone dry, and their larvae will need it a little damp in the substrate. Awesome. I think I might put my uh, my name on a culture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be selling cultures of about still estimating, but probably around six to eight larvae but still estimating how many I'll have by the fall expos. Awesome. Awesome. Very cool stuff. Um, everyone, if you are in Canada and you do come out to the expos, make sure you stop by the Planet Invert booth. Uh, it is a fascinating booth. It's super unique. It's super cool to like, you kind of, I, you kind of look down at, and, and, and you know, you got to really focus, but once you look down, there's a whole like different world in each one of those like vivariums and displays you bring. And uh, it's really is super fascinating and super cool to see. So if you are in Canada and you are coming out to the expos, if you're not coming out to the expos, you're making a mistake, come out to the expos and make sure you stop by Planet Invert's booth. Um, Corbin, thank you very, very, very much for coming on. Can you let everyone know where they can find you? Uh, you can find me at planet underscore inverts on Instagram or planet inverts on Facebook as well. No website just yet, but it is in the works. Awesome. Awesome. I will make sure I have the Instagram and Facebook link in the description. Make sure you give them a follow. And um, yeah, thank you all very much for listening. Corbin, once again, thank you very much for coming on. And we will see you very shortly at the upcoming expo, I'm sure. Uh, thank you for having me.